cracking down on the Irish who rebelled uh, and ended up starting a war in 1848. Uh, that didn't work. But what it did is it sent a lot of Irish uh, leaving, uh, having almost a million people uh, departed Ireland. Many of them came to the United States, Canada, or Australia. But there have been Irish who, years even long before that, had started. Uh, but at the time of the Civil War, we've got about 1.6 million people uh, that are Irish descendants. I keep in mind the 1860 census, you only talk about where you were born or where your father was born. Uh, so that's 1.6 million people in the United States who were either born in Ireland or their dad or mom were born in Ireland. Uh, doesn't count any second or, or any third or fourth generation folks. Uh, a lot of Irish obviously concentrated in the big cities. Uh, they were very prevalent. In fact, one quarter of all the population of New York City were Irish. 22% uh, of Brooklyn, that was a separate city than New York. Uh, Brooklyn during the Civil War was an independent city. Um, Philadelphia, I'm going to come back to in a minute. 46,000 Irish in Boston. You can see the population. In several towns you traditionally think of as more German, such as St. Louis yes. and Cincinnati. Um, having went to college in Cincinnati, I can attest to all the Germans in that area. Uh, but certainly the Irish are still a key part of the population of there. Now, what's often overlooked is the fact that the Irish were also streaming into the South during the same period of time, coming into places like Savannah, uh, Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. Uh, but the number one port, in fact, the number two port in the United States, the number one port uh, in the South for Irish immigration after the... Uh, potato famine and the failed riots and the uh, rebellion in 1848 was New Orleans. Um, 25,000 people lived in uh, New Orleans at the time of the Civil War uh, that were uh, Irish first or second generations. Uh, Memphis was another uh, heavy concentration. Again, about one out of every four people in Memphis uh, could trace Irish ancestry. We are in Philadelphia. The first Irish actually came in the same boat with the first Quakers. So the Irish and the English Quakers can co-claim, co if you will, the uh, first white settlement of southeastern Pennsylvania uh, as the Irish started, and, uh, started in 1682. Over the next 80 or 90 years, uh, most of the Irish that came into Pennsylvania came as indentured servants. Uh, they would book passage on boats coming into Ireland, uh, coming from Ireland into places like Philadelphia, certainly. Uh, and in exchange for a set period of time where they would work as a servant for the people who paid for their uh, ticket, uh, they would, uh, you know, end up uh, in this again this indentured servant system. Uh, that kind of started waning over time, but again, a number of those of us with Irish roots, and especially my my wife's family, uh, can attest some of their background to that. Ben Franklin, in 1770, published a description of the population of Philadelphia, it's kind of an obscure uh, uh, book that he put out, but he claimed at that point in time, one-third of everybody in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, well, actually in this case, the province, uh, colonial province, were Irish. Uh, and that was right off the boat, Irish at that point. Over time in Pennsylvania, as in other parts of the United States, uh, a lot of anti-Irish, anti-Catholic, anti-non-American sentiment arose. In fact, you had people being elected to political office with the Know Nothing or Whig or uh, American Party. Um, and a lot of these nativists were very upset about the immigrants that kept flooding into the country. Uh, 1844 in May and again in, in June, uh, sorry, in July of 1844, in Philadelphia, had some pretty serious riots, uh, which uh, a number of people were badly injured or killed uh, in these anti-Irish uh, rebellions. Again, the, the native-born Americans, some of whom still had Irish blood in them, ironically, uh, were beating up and torturing and killing uh, some of the new Irish that arrived. By the time of the Civil War, yeah, it pretty much calmed down. Uh, Millard Fillmore in 1856 was the last nativist uh, candidate for president. As we all know, James Buchanan beats him and James Fremont, John C. Fremont, uh, pretty handily in 1856, although Millard Fillmore still gets a pretty fair amount of votes in Philadelphia uh, from people who are still upset about the Irish coming in. But there were 95,500 or so 
Irish, uh, first or second generation, that lived in Pennsylvania at the start of the war. As we know, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln uh, carried the North and ended up becoming elected president. The Irish, as a generalization, but it was fairly true, uh, the Irish in the United States at that period of time, in the 1850s, 1860s, tended to be Democrat. Uh, they tended to support very heavily the uh, policies of the Democratic president. In fact, as far as we can tell in Pennsylvania, the Irish voted overwhelmingly for James Buchanan uh, in 1856 and again uh, in 1860 for either the fusion ticket of John Breckinridge and Stephen Douglas or for Stephen Douglas himself. So as a political force, uh, the Irish tended to be very, very uh, democratic. Now, that's going to play a role as the Civil War begins. Uh, one well, probably little known fact is the two first the two first two men to die in the American Civil War were both natives of Ireland. Um, as we all know, Fort Sumter is going to surrender to the Confederate troops after the bombardment. But Major Robert Anderson, um, part of the uh, uh, Anderson family in Ohio, uh, decides that he wants to fire a salute to the flag. Uh, and they're going to have the big guns do that. Well, one of the big guns misfires as they are lowering the flag and they're firing the ceremonial salute. And Dan Roth uh, from Tipperary, Ireland, uh, is the very first man officially credited as dying in the American Civil War. Uh, and he dies not from Confederate action, but from fragments of the cannon blowing up on him. A second man, Ed Galloway from County Cork, will die of his injuries later that night. Uh, and again, these are the first two people to perish in the fighting. They certainly by no means will be the last Irishman to die. Now, Lincoln's got a problem at the start of the war. He's calling for 75,000 volunteers to join the Union Army, uh, thinks the war is going to end fairly quickly, needs them for 90 days. But he needs the Irish to start responding. Uh, and one of his early political moves is Lincoln and his emissaries start courting the Irish uh, population, particularly in the big cities. And a number of former or current Democrats uh, actually start responding to Lincoln's call. The one that we're probably most famous with is Thomas Marr. Uh, Thomas Francis Marr is from Waterford, Ireland. Uh, he, like so many other Irishmen, were involved in the rebellion against Great Britain. Uh, but unlike a lot of the Irish, he's caught and he sends to death. Uh, they put him on a ship send him to Australia, uh, where he promptly escapes uh, just four years later and finds his way to New York City, where within short order in the next year or so, he becomes very prominent in the New York City Irish community, as well as in the Democratic Party on uh, that place. Uh, he, he becomes an attorney. He edits an Irish newspaper, uh, joins the New York State militia. But uh, Lincoln and the politicians in uh, New York Horatio Seymour, a uh, Democratic governor of New York, other folks uh, involved, convinced Marr to lead Irishmen onto the battlefield. Uh, so Thomas Marr will raise one of the first significant Irish regiments in the United States, uh, the 69th New York. Uh, and obviously, as we most of us know, Marr would go on to command the Irish Brigade uh, for much of the Civil War, and we'll talk more about that. So most of us have heard of Thomas Marr. Uh, but the time of, the, uh, of his en enlistment, if you will, by Lincoln and the administration, he's actually not the most famous Irishman in the United States. Uh, this happens to be the recruiting poster, by the way, that Thomas Marr uh, and Patrick Nugent uh, put out for the 69th. But arguably the most famous uh, person in the United States of Irish ancestry is Michael Corcoran. Uh, Michael Corcoran, again, uh, is, is moved to New York in 1849. He's not a rebel, uh, but right away he ends up uh, becoming highly involved in the New York State Militia. Now, in uh, the early 1860s, the son of the King of England comes to the United States for a tour of a number of major cities of the U.S., uh, and Corcoran, in charge of the New York State Militia in Philadelphia or in the New York City area, is actually ordered to march in a parade honoring the uh, son, the prince, uh, son of the king, and he's not going to do it. He stubbornly refuses. Uh, the state of New York presses charges against him, 
threaten him with uh, being imprisoned and thrown out of the New York State militia. Uh, but he becomes a hero to the Irish community throughout the country. Uh, bitterness, I mean, in the 1840s and 50s, there was a ton, and I mean a ton, of resentment towards the British crown still in the United States among these exiles. Uh, and they were very, very adamant in their hatred, uh, outright venom towards the crown. Uh, and Corcoran was no different. Uh, and only the firing on Fort Sumter saves this guy's uh, bacon, uh, because now Lincoln turns to him as well uh, in the War Department, and uh, Michael Corcoran now raises the Corcoran's Legion. He remains really strong friends with Thomas Marr. Uh, in fact, he will die uh, shortly around Christmas in 1863 when he's borrowed uh, Thomas Marr's horse, and the horse uh, uh, slips on the ice, and he falls off, and he's dead. Um, but never hurt Corcoran for that reason, and Marr goes on to become the leading Irish soldier, if you will, early in the war. Uh, this is Corcoran's uh, wanted, uh, wanted poster, his uh, recruiting poster for the Third Irish. Uh, you can see they were already very early in the war. They're paying 150 bucks to any Irishman that wants to sign up. That's a lot of money, and you actually had people coming in off their boats in Boston and New York, places like that. They're taking this $150 uh, bounty to join some of these Irish regiments. Chicago is another place. Lincoln, of course, uh, spent a lot of time in Illinois. He was a, an attorney for the Illinois Central Railroad uh, at the same time that George McClellan was president of that railroad. Uh, Lincoln had a lot of Illinois connections, of course, lived in Springfield. Uh, he was personal friends with Jim Mulligan. Uh, James Mulligan uh, organized the first Irish regiment in the Chicago area. Uh, he's a second-generation Irishman. Both of his parents were Irish. Uh, and James Mulligan has the distinction of being the first Irish officer to surrender his entire regiment, uh, where at the Battle of Lexington in September of 1861, he and all of his men uh, surrendered to Sterling Price, and the regiment's disbanded. Now, keep in mind the politics that I mentioned. A lot of these Irishmen are Democrats. So, of course, is George McClellan. Although McClellan, of course, is more of uh, Scots Irish background than a uh, Irish Catholic or Irish Presbyterian background, uh, he nevertheless brings Jim Mulligan and the 23rd back. Uh, so the uh, 23rd will serve for the rest of the war. Mulligan and his men will play a role in the Gettysburg campaign uh, during the retreat. Uh, they will uh, try to block uh, Robert E. Lee's route through the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, 1864, Mulligan dies in the Shenandoah Valley. In fact, the, the Second Battle of Turnstown. But his men keep fighting. Uh, they will fight the entire war, and the 23rd Illinois will be one of the Irish regiments present uh, in the Grand Review at Washington after the war. And they're one of the Irish regiments, of course, at the surrender of Robert E. Lee. Um, this is Mulligan's brigade. Now, if you're living in Chicago, look at the money you get: 402 bucks. If you happen to be in New York City, you're only going to get $150. Uh, but Mulligan's brigade is looking to... Now, you, the kicker is you had to be a veteran of one of these three-month regiments that had already seen some service. Uh, but Mulligan's going to give you $402 to sign up. But that's the big print. If you go down towards the middle, uh, well, wait a minute. The pay, bounty, and the premium for three years will average $24 a month for veterans and $21.30 per month. You're not getting $402 up front. That's the net amount of money he's going to pay you. In New York, you get the $150 up front. Uh, so this turns out to be somewhat of a misleading poster until you read the fine print. Uh, and the Irish, a lot of them were actually upset when they found out they weren't going to get $402 up front. Uh, the next Irish I want to talk about, maybe the most unique one of all, uh, Jim Shields, obviously, those of us who are longtime Civil War buffs will recognize this name from the Shenandoah Valley Campaign, 1862. Uh, James Shields uh, is not an immigrant from the 1840s, unlike the other guys we talked about. He actually came in 1826. Now, he fights in the Black Hawk War, but he's a political enemy of Abraham Lincoln. The two guys don't like each other at all. Uh, and he challenges Lincoln to a duel. Now, in those days, the person who got challenged could select the venue and the weapons. Lincoln picks an island in the Mississippi River with just him and little James Shields, uh, and he wants to fight with broadswords, which you can imagine uh, Abraham Lincoln, the rail splitter, at the peak of his uh, physical prowess, 
wielding a broadsword and cleaving Jim Shields in two. Well, Shields didn't like that prospect, so he very quickly uh, makes his peace with Abraham Lincoln. The two of them end up as pretty good friends. In fact, in 1861, Shields is named as a Brigadier General, and Lincoln is the man who actually pushes uh, for Shields to get that uh, approval. Jim Shields uh, goes down in history as the only man to uh, pretty decisively beat Stonewall Jackson during the 1862 Valley Campaign, winning at the first battle of Kernstown, uh, where he's wounded. And he's going to go back to California. He's going to run for senator in California. It's going to lose. Well, look what this guy does. He moves all over the United States and actually he becomes the only man in American history to fight uh, or to be elected into the United States Senate from three different states and recognize he also lost in California. So he's the only guy to ever run four times from four different states. Uh, so he would move wherever the political winds took him so that he could uh, get himself elected. Now, I mentioned uh, the Irish in the United States. Best uh, Damien Shields, who is an Irish expert living actually in Ireland, um, has sent me a lot of data that I used in the book. He estimates there were 180,000 first or second generation Irish serving in the United States troops uh, during the Civil War. Now, we all, you know, our image is the uh, Irish carrying the green flags. And so I went on the internet and pulled out just, you know, a handful of different battle flags to show you. But what's interesting, if you look in the middle, uh, the 9th ninth, uh, ninth New York, Connecticut Volunteers, they didn't carry a green flag, they carried a blue flag. And in fact, a number of Irish regiments also, in fact, most of Pennsylvania's Irish regiments, all but one, carried blue flags, uh, not the green we typically think of. There were 20,000 uh, soldiers, by Damien's estimate, that fought in the Irish regiments in the South. Uh, the largest and probably best known being the 10th Tennessee. Uh, Sixth Louisiana was also almost exclusively Irish, again, raised in New Orleans from a lot of those 25,000 immigrants that were in New Orleans. Almost 1,000 of them uh, flocked to the Sixth Louisiana at the start of the war. Uh, Eighth Alabama had your traditional Irish flag. 24th Georgia, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, as we go forward tonight. Their flag is, of course, the traditional stars and bars with the Irish harp uh, added to the white uh, center stripe. So I'm going to switch gears for a minute and just talk about some of the Irish regiments, and we're going to chat about some of the battles in which these guys fought in. 116th Pennsylvania is one of the Irish regiments, uh, one of the more famous Irish regiments from Pennsylvania. They're predominantly raised in southeastern uh, part of the state. Uh, they are added to the Irish Brigade along with the 69th New York, 28th Massachusetts, uh, uh, you know, shortly after Antietam. Um, and you can see the, the makeup that Antietam, the five regiments that consist of the Irish Brigade. Now, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, something very unique happens. Uh, number one, they're going to lose their colonel, uh, and the lieutenant colonel is going to take over for the rest of the war. But what happens on this battlefield at Fredericksburg, I have found very few parallels in the uh, annals of the Civil War. So let me set the background for you. Uh, they are going to charge Marie's Heights, uh, and they're going to fight directly against Cobb's Georgia Legion. Now, I mentioned earlier the flag that I show you again on the 24th Georgia. They're, again, highly Irish regiment, a lot of guys from Savannah, uh, that area. Uh, well, these Georgians are up on the heights, and they spot the Irish Brigade flags coming at them. Uh, and they instantly know that they're, fa they're facing Mars Irish Brigade. Uh, and, you know, in some of the accounts uh, talk about soldiers crying, you know, by heavens, here are Mars boys, we're in for it. Uh, one Georgian supposedly cries, you know, God, what a pity we have to fire on Mars men. Well, five separate times the Irish Brigade charges Stonewall and Mary's Heights five separate times. Every single time the Georgians shoot them back. The Irish continue to come, and the Georgians keep shooting at them. And soon the ground in front of Mary's Heights is littered with blue soldiers uh, with green sprigs of boxwood in their cappies or forage hats, uh, laying there bleeding, dead, or dying, or hunkering the ground. William McCarter talks about our shattered and bleeding ranks held their ground. He's 116th Pennsylvania. Determined to fight to the last, Irish blood was up. At the end of the last of the five attacks, here's the unique thing that happened. 
According to McCarter, the Irish uh, rebels, to a man, stood up behind the stone wall and gave a standing ovation to the Irish uh, of the, uh, the Mars Brigade. Now, Dana, uh, Rick, uh, Dick, I mean, any of you guys around here that are along with me, any of you guys know of any other battles in the American Civil War where the Confederates or the, or the Union stood and cheered and gave a standing ovation to their opponents? I don't. This is the, one of the very few times I can find anything like this in the annals of Civil War history. The fact that I don't, obviously the opposite is quite true, where people would mock and scorn uh, and, you know, cry Fredericksburg or uh, cry other things up. But this is one of the few times, and the Irish just hated killing each other, uh, where, again, they gave a standing ovation, if you will, to their defeated opponents. Let's switch gears and run to the South just for a minute. I want to chat a little bit about the 6th Louisiana. Uh, these guys were organized to camp more than pretty typical of the Irish regiments in the Southern uh, uh, armies. Uh, they're recruited in New Orleans and the area immediately around New Orleans. They perform very well uh, under Richard Yule at First Manassas. They do, they do a pretty fine job. Uh, they are brigaded under Richard Taylor in the 1st Louisiana Brigade. Uh, They're eventually going to take on the name Louisiana Tigers. Uh, so obviously this regiment, having written a book on the Louisiana Tigers, Gettysburg Campaign, these guys are one of my favorites uh, in terms of Southern troops. Uh, and they're going to fight at Sharpsburg and Antietam. Uh, now, at Antietam, uh, Sharpsburg, they're going to lose the colonel of the 6th Louisiana, Henry Strong, and 11 of the officers, including all three field officers, are going to be killed or, or seriously wounded. Uh, it's pretty devastating to the regiment. Now, one of the landmarks of the Antietam battle is Colonel Strong's body and the body of his horse. Uh, in this photograph, Strong is actually laying it behind the horse. You can't really see him from this angle. But Rufus Dawes uh, from the 6th Wisconsin of Gettysburg fame uh, writes about, wrote a, a classic letter about a horse apparently in the act of rising from the ground, had it held proudly aloft, four legs set firmly forward. Nothing could be more vigorous or lifelike than the pose of this animal. Well, that's Henry Strong Court. Uh, and a lot of soldiers actually talk about this unique horse because most horses, when they die, lay down. Uh, this horse uh, was apparently trying to get up from the ground when it expired and a rigor mortis set in and it froze in this position. Um, and again, you know, it's the only known photograph of Strong's horse, but there are dozens and dozens of accounts of this Irish born major um, and his lifeless body next to his horse. Sixth Louisiana, of course, is going to fight at Gettysburg. They're part of the assault, uh, night assault on East Cemetery Hill where some of my ancestors in the 7th West Virginia of the Gibraltar Brigade of the 2nd Corps will be involved in repulsing the attack on Cemetery Hill. Uh, the 6th Louisiana ends up fighting a Vigrix battery. They, uh, so you think really it's these Irish guys uh, fighting against a bunch of Germans. Uh, Vigrix battery from Buffalo is almost exclusively German. In fact, most of the men in the, uh, that particular battery are first or second generation Germans. And uh, most of the officers speak their commands in German. Uh, so you have a mixture of English and Gaelic and German uh, being, you know, muttered at each other. In a one classic account, uh, an Irishman jumps on the barrel, uh, uh, puts sand on one of the barrels of the Buffalo Battery's guns and claims it in the name of the Confederacy just about the same time that a German utters, Das ist unser, uh, meaning this is ours and pulls the lanyard and blows the uh, Louisiana Tiger Irishman to kingdom come. Well, the 6th Louisiana is going to spend the rest of the war still in the Army of Potomac, uh, our Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, they are going to be devastated at Rappahannock Station in the fall of 1864. A lot of their men are captured. By the time of the Appomattox, just to give you an idea, uh, out of the original 1,146 Irishmen who enlisted in New Orleans, 52 of them were left in the ranks. That's in the entire ranks. Uh, and only 30 uh, were still present at Appomattox uh, from the original contingent. Uh, these guys, you know, it's an amazing loss. Now, some of these guys have deserted. Some have died of, of illness. Uh, but a lot of these are battle casualties. And in 6th Louisiana, the numbers are really difficult to tell, may have taken one of the top 10 highest percentage losses 
of any Confederate regiment in the entire war. They just shot to pieces. Uh, let's go back to Thomas Marr. Uh, Marr is gone by the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he is uh, off on recruiting duty. Uh, and the Irish Brigade is now commanded by his senior colonel, a fellow by the name of Patrick Kelly. Uh, we're all familiar with this Irish monument uh, at Gettysburg. But how many of you know the Pennsylvania connection to this monument? Anybody know? Believe it or not, this, the Irish Brigade monument is designed by a Confederate soldier, not a, uh, a Union soldier. It's a Confederate soldier who serves in Henry, uh, Hillary Pollard's artillery battalion that comes to York, Pennsylvania. Uh, and this guy is actually uh, in York for three days before the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, uh, and he goes back, fights in the battle, survives the war. After the war, becomes a very famous sculptor, uh, and is invited to, uh, you know, put the the New Yorkers uh, invite this former Confederate to actually design their monument, and he does. Uh, he's the only known Confederate soldier that I can find that actually designed uh, a monument, a Union monument at Gettysburg. Uh, so. Again, uh, he was here in York uh, for two, uh, three nights. Now, we've all familiar with William Corby, of course. We, I think we all know the story of Corby, Corby giving absolution uh, on the rock to uh, Hancock in the Second Corps, John Gibbon, uh, John Caldwell, people like that are present for the religious ceremony. There's a couple of interesting things, though. One uh, is the statue. Uh, the same statue, believe it or not, is on the campus of Notre Dame University. Uh, and to my friends who may have attended Notre Dame, uh, they will tell you that popularly in Notre Dame, uh, the statue of Corby, Corby is known as First Down Corby uh, because the, uh, he's giving the NFL officials first down signal. Uh, and, the, and also at the Notre Dame campus is Jesus with his arms outstretched, and they call him Touchdown Jesus and First Down Corby. Uh, so modern students in Notre Dame uh, well, playing football or interested in football games or getting a little taste of Civil War history, probably most of them not realizing this exact same monument uh, that exists on the Gettysburg battlefield. The other regiment in Pennsylvania I want to briefly chat about is the 69th. Uh, they are actually paid for by money from California. Uh, California, Oregon, places like that out west, uh, we're way too far away to participate by sending men, but they could send money. Uh, and so three regiments, in fact, were raised in uh, Pennsylvania, 1st, 2nd, 3rd California. Well, the 2nd California, uh, under Colonel Patty Owen, uh, when they get absorbed into the Pennsylvania troops, they are given the honor of selecting their own number. And they choose, even though they're not the 69th Regiment to be raised in Pennsylvania, they asked for and received permission to call themselves the 69th Pennsylvania in honor of Thomas Mars, 69th New York. Uh, the 69th Pennsylvania, as far as we know, will be the only, only Irish regiment from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to carry the flag of the green flag in the battle. Now, much similar to the 6th Louisiana, at Appomattox, there's only 56 guys left in the 69th roster of the original 1,000 that enrolled in Philadelphia uh, for this regiment. Again, you know, a lot of losses, guys mustering out, et cetera. 69th uh, has a nice monument at Gettysburg. Uh, you can see the veterans of the 69th, 2nd uh, California, that had come to Gettysburg, 1887, for the dedication of their monument. They had lost, uh, you know, well over half of their men at Gettysburg. This is the highest loss the 69th is going to take during the entire Civil War. Now, we talked about Corbin, uh, but William Corby's not the only Catholic priest by any stretch of imagination to serve. Uh, 43 Catholic priests serve as chaplains. Uh, interestingly, only 25 of them are in Irish regiments. Uh, the other, uh, you know, 18 men are actually either in Protestant regiments or in German Catholic regiments. Um, but Paul Cooney, Peter Paul Cooney is an interesting uh, story because he works with William Corby after the Civil War uh, on the campus of Notre Dame. Uh, Peter Paul Cooney and uh, William Corby are pretty, pretty good friends. 
uh, before the war. Now, this guy, unlike uh, Corby, he is a graduate of Notre Dame, so he's got deep, deep roots. Uh, he uh, raises the 1st Irish Regiment, or the 1st Irish Brigade, as the Indians called themselves early in the war, uh, 35th Irish. Now, like Corby, although most people have never heard his story, he climbs on a rock at Stones River uh, on uh, December 31st, 1862, and gives absolution to the 31st 5th Indiana. Uh, well, Cooney, um, you know, as Corby, Corby had, Cor uh, Father William Corby had General Hancock present for his abolition at Gettysburg, Cooney does one better. On Easter Sunday, 1864, he gives absolution to the troops uh, in the Easter uh, service and gives uh, people, you see, uh, you see Cooney there in his white uh, ceremonial robes with the yellow uh, tassels. Immediately to the right on the picture, that's William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, so that's the entire brass of the Army of, of the Ohio, the Army of the Cumberland, uh, Sherman's forces that are in and around Atlanta. Uh, and Cooney actually personally gives them uh, to these officers, very few of which, of course, are Irish. Let's talk about a few individual soldiers for just a couple of minutes. Uh, Tom Murphy is emblematic. Uh, there were 146 Irishmen that received the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Three Irishmen actually received two medals uh, after the war. Tom Murphy's pretty typical. Uh, he's a 20-year-old uh, immigrant, uh, first generation, and only been in the country just a few years. Uh, at, during the Siege of Vicksburg, two regiments in the Union Army and Grant's Army are shooting at each other, uh, and Tom Murphy volunteers to jump up and run between the lines and tell these two full colonels, as he calls them later, to quit shooting at one another. Uh, so he's pretty typical. It's just one of the many stories of Irishmen that pick up uh, medals of honor. Uh, and down in Maryland, Joseph Stewart, for example, and the first Maryland, uh, he's an interesting story in the standpoint that we know almost nothing about this guy. Uh, comes to Baltimore before the war, uh, joined the Union Army in 1864, captures the Confederate flag, it's discharged, and he's one of the few men that the United States Army can't track after the Civil War. In fact, the Medal of Honor Society uh, looked for many years to find information on this guy, and he just totally disappeared. Uh, nobody knows that Stuart died uh, right after the war. Did he go out west, change his name like so many other men did? Did he go get killed by the Indians somewhere? Did he die in a drunken stupor as an unknown somewhere on the, in uh, Maryland and Baltimore? He just totally disappears. It's one of the very, very few men that have ever won the Medal of Honor that we have no clue when they died, where they died, where they're buried. Nothing about this guy exists after his discharge in 1865. Now, we talked about Irish men. Let's talk about an Irish lady. This is uh, Jenny Hodgers. She's born on Christmas Day in Ireland in County Loud. Uh, he comes with her father to the U.S. Now, her mother's gone the point in time, and the dad has a bunch of kids. He's got a raise. So he puts a, as many of them that he can, male and female, working in an all-male shoe factory. Uh, Jenny's a little uh, girl. She's 5'11", 110 pounds, uh, and she calls herself Albert D.J. Cashier uh, as her adopted name, if you will, and she masquerades as a man in the shoe factory. Well, she ends up in the 95th Illinois. She's going to fight as a, as a man, for 40 battles. So she's going to live the rest of her life as a man, in fact, uh, until she's hit by a car. One of the few Civil War veterans that I can find that's hit by a car. I mean, something I obviously couldn't have imagined uh, when they're fighting at Vicksburg. Uh, and as she goes into emergency surgery to save her life, they discover she's not a man. Um, and she dies in 1915, uh, she, and her gravestone actually has both names on it uh, in Illinois. Um, Ralph Bryant, it's not going to spend a lot of time there. I want to go to the Claiborne's for a minute. We all know this guy. This is Patrick Claiborne, of course, the Stonewall of the West. Uh, he's about as Irish as you can get. Uh, born on St. Patrick's Day. But what a lot of people may not realize is he doesn't serve in the Irish Rebellion. He serves in the British Army. Uh, he's one of the Irishmen that stays loyal to the crown uh, for a number of years. And, in fact, he ends up leaving under good terms comes to the United States in 1849, uh, as we, most of us probably realize, he's one of the Confederates that will rise from private to major general 
uh, during the Civil War. He's killed in 1864 at the Battle of Franklin, uh, just down there about three weeks ago, uh, at the Compton Plantation, where the bodies of six generals uh, were eventually laid out. So this is Patrick Claiborne. What most people are going to realize is his brothers also fought the Confederate Army. One of them uh, discovered his gravesite quite by accident uh, just a few weeks ago as I was coming back from Tennessee. I pulled off to see the battlefield at Coyd's Mountain that I'd never been to, and I saw this little grave site with a uh, Virginia Civil War Trails marker beside it. So I pull over, and this is in the middle of the hot, you know, off the highway, probably three miles from the Cloyd's uh, Mountain Battlefield. And lo and behold, it's Christopher Claiborne, Patrick Claiborne's half-brother, his youngest half-brother. He served in the 2nd Kentucky Cavalry, uh, born in Ireland, uh, dies during the retreat from Cloyd's Mountain. Now, what's interesting about this guy is he asked to be buried where he fell. He was mortally wounded, didn't want to be buried anywhere else, but he wanted to be buried with his face overlooking the town of Dublin, Virginia. You know, his connection, of course, to being back home in Ireland. Uh, a few years ago, they rerouted the road. They actually dug up Christopher Claiborne's bones uh, from where they, they, he'd originally been buried. They reinter him off to the side of the new road, uh, probably about 50 yards or so from his original burial site. But if you're ever off of I-81, heading down to Tennessee or anywhere, uh, and you've got a few extra minutes, this is at the Dublin exit. Uh, and uh, again, you know, I'd never had known that Patrick Claiborne's brother was uh, laying there dead. This one's personal. I grew up in southeastern Ohio, 10 miles from uh, Somerset, Ohio. Uh, in the town square, uh, in the traffic circle in downtown Somerset, is this equestrian statue of Phil Sheridan. Uh, Phil Sheridan may have been born in uh, Ohio, but most accounts suggest he was either born on a boat coming to the United States, uh, but more likely was probably born in upstate New York. But he's raised in Somerset, Ohio, uh, which he always claimed was his home. Uh, my connection with these guys are is the Sheridan High School Fighting Generals were my arch rival high school uh, in uh, high school sports. We hated these guys, just hated them. So I grew up with a prejudice against Phil Sheridan. Uh, and my fondest moment in high school sports was uh, blocking a punt against these guys. And uh, uh, one of my teammates ran it in for a touchdown. So I was never a big fan of Phil, uh, Phil Sheridan. Uh, over the years, though, I've come to you know get a new appreciation for the guy now that I'm long not playing sports against Sheridan High School. But I love this quote about Sheridan from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he's asked to describe Sheridan, and he says, Sheridan's a brown, chunky little chap with a long body, short legs, not enough neck to hang him, such long arms that if his ankles itch, he could scratch them without stooping. That, ladies and gentlemen, may be the single best description of a Union general ever written by a president of the United States. It's a great quote. I mean, Lincoln nails Phil, little Phil to a T. A uh, wonderful quote. Last couple of slides. Uh, we started off we're talking about uh, the first two men to die in the Civil War were Irishmen uh, at Fort Sumter. Uh, here we've got Thomas Smith, uh, or Thomas Smith, as some people uh, call him. Uh, he's the Irishman born again, Christmas Day, County Court. He is the last general, Union general, to die in the American Civil War. Uh, he actually will expire. Uh, he shot at High Bridge by Confederate uh, shark bear. He will die uh, in a field hospital the exact same day that uh, the uh, Confederate Army in Northern Virginia is surrendering to U.S. Grant. Uh, so the war begins with an Irish death, and the war ends, at least from the general standpoint, uh, at Appomattox with another Irishman dying. Of course, there'll be other Irishmen dying in the uh, other battles after that that are fought, but Thomas Smith will get down in history as the last uh, officer with Irish roots to die in the Civil War. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Ricky for any comments. Like I said, I wanted to go just a, you know, a few of the more than 150 or so stories that Gary and I include in our book, uh, Aaron Gilbra, uh, available from Gettysburg Publishing at most fine retailers or Civil War and more. Uh, or on the internet, of course, from uh, Gettysburg Publishing, or from online retailers, Target.com, Walmart.com, or uh, Amazon, of course. Uh, 
So Ricky, do we have time for a couple questions if anybody may have one or any comments or any favorite Irish uh, stories people want to talk about uh, Irish soldiers or their Irish ancestors? Yeah, we got, we got plenty of time. I said, if somebody has a question or comment, just go ahead and unmute themselves and then, then ask the question. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that I've always been interested in is just the fact that, you know, basically in just about a generation, the Irish in Pennsylvania went from being hated in Philadelphia to being venerated in the post-war parades. Uh, as soon as the 69th or the 116th marched in uh, the parades, they were greeted with massive cheers, loud applause, um, and, you know, the very same people in some cases that had rioted in Philadelphia, you know, only, you know, a short you know, 20 years or so before the uh, end of the Civil War are in many cases the same people that are cheering these two Irish regiments uh, as they return home to uh, Philadelphia. Okay, does anybody have any questions and comments? Uh, nice and quiet. Ah, not a problem. <laughs> Back to the second talk I've given today. The last one was about an hour-long live talk uh, in Berks County, so uh, you know my throat's starting to go. So I don't mind if there's not a lot of questions, but if there are any. Certainly, feel free. Scott, uh, Steve Smith here with a question. What uh, what's the story of the? Is it a dog at the foot of the cross on yeah. your your cover? Yeah, it's an, it's an Irish wolfhound. Uh, and what's funny, you know, a lot of it, people when they go to Gettysburg will put dog bones on their monument. I've actually overheard, I've stood there a few times, and I've heard people talk about, you know, this Irish wolfhound that gets killed during the battle, uh, but no, he doesn't. Uh, the Irish wolfhound, there is no Irish wolfhound at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the, in the Irish culture, uh, the wolfhound was a symbol of strength and courage. Uh, and so when the uh, monument, again, was designed in, for the life, and they can't remember the name of the uh, Confederate from uh, Hillary Jones's artillery battalion uh, that designed the thing, but uh, he ends up putting the Irish Wolfhound uh, as well and the Celtic Cross, two leading symbols of uh, the Irish culture in North America, on the monument. But no, there there was no Irish dogs at Gettysburg. Plenty of other dogs, another of those. So thanks for thanks for asking, Steve. Great question. That comes up a lot. I'm surprised at how many people. And a lot of the licensed battlefield guides uh, tell me the same. When I did my uh, three-day charm school trying to become a licensed guide a couple years ago, that was one thing that a lot of the guides were talking about and laughing about how often that they were they got comments about, did the, did the dog live? Did the dog live? Now the dog wasn't there. Thanks, Scott. Okay, anything else for anybody? What just a quick one, just, uh, like I said, there's, there's not going to be any meeting next month, but in, uh, if you see here in, in January of 21st, we're going to have George, I hope I pronounce it, Gooch. Uh, he's going to do the uh, raid, murder, and retribution, the uh, Walter Railroad raid of uh, December 1864. So that's who our next speaker is going to be. And here's just a list of what we've got. I want to give a shout out to Tom, who did some great work. Here's our uh, speakers for next year. And like I say, what we're going to do is we're going to be, if all goes well, we're going to be doing Zoom until April. And in April, we're going to be doing um, in person talks. And it's, you know, it looks like the country is going to be done probably in 2021. We're going to meet at the, uh, the VDA, the Veterans, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America's Hall on 800 Dairy Street. And I'll put that information out for people for directions there. It's probably about what 10 minutes away from where we normally meet towards Harrisburg. It's just on the back side of um, Walmart, Walmart and, and Sam's Club is on the other side, on the other side of the tracks. So if we have nothing else, uh, wish everybody happy Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas. And Steve, we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow when you talk for the Harrisburg Civil Roundtable. And again, Scott, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's great. And we'll try to get together somebody's time to do some uh, tours with you. See what's Sounds going on good, in New York guys. and all those. Thanks. Have okay. a great night. Okay.